<laughs> Jeremiah? So, Ashley, are you over the moon about the Princess Leia here to get a design? Beyond over the moon. Um, you know, it was one of those things where I was, it was a busy day. I was, you know, having a bunch of meetings for her universe. And it, it was also kind of a frustrating day, too. I don't remember exactly what was going on. And then I look at my email, and I get this email asking if I want to design Mickey ears or mini ears. And it was just like, all of life's problems just melted away because I'm like, what? And so I, I almost didn't believe it. And I, I, you know, obviously called them back and um, heard more about the program. And I'm like, what? wait, what, what, you really want me to design ears? And so I went in for a meeting and um, they literally, they showed me all, like all the ears that they were working on and they said, do whatever you want. <laughs> and, wow. and that was almost more intimidating to say, you mean any, anything? And so obviously we went back to Star Wars and you know, kind of the, the world that I, I live in most and, and obviously love so much. And, um, and so I actually had just a, a weekend and they said, you know, design whatever Star Wars ears you want. And I'm not a professional artist, so um, everything looks like a, an elementary school art project. And so I pulled out my colored pencils and my construction paper and uh, my ruler, and, and I um, hand drew about five or six pairs of ears. And uh, we obviously landed on Princess Leia, and they're amazing. They're covered in Swarovski crystal, and they're, they're gonna be beautiful. So they'll be coming out next year. I think. Yes, um, Brett, you said you told a story about Fantasmic yesterday, uh -huh. and it's hard for me to explain it in a tweet, and I just wondered if you could tell Re that again. Recap the story? Yes. Yeah, Thank well, uh, the story of Fantasmic is just that, for me, Fantasmic, is, well, Fantasmic has always been the most quintessential Disney show. Uh, the fact that it comes out of nowhere, and it's this big, powerful, imaginative world, was always so fascinating to me, and it inspired a lot of my dreaming and my creativity, uh, but also my love of Disney and love specifically for Mickey. Uh, so I used to play Fantasmic as a kid. My brother and I would put on our own shows and um, I started doing voices by impersonating all the characters in the show and that's actually where I started to figure out that I kind of sounded like Mickey. Um, so I did that for years growing up and um, fast forward to a few years ago, they updated the show and I was asked to, to voice Mickey in it because they were adding a few more dialogue parts. Um, and at the time, there had been talk to, to leave Wayne Allwayne's performance in for the last line, some imagination, because it's such an iconic line, just to pay homage to him, and I completely agreed with that. Um, I actually felt odd going in to re-record the show in the first place, um, but I did, and uh, when I went to finally see it, uh, I was with my brother, who I used to play Fantasmic with, and we watched it together, and the whole time was kind of fun, you know, just reacting with one another to say, how cool is that? But then the final line came and Mickey said, some imagination, huh? And it was me. And it was just a, it was a total surreal full circle moment that it's, it's hard to put into words. Um, but my brother turned to me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, did you ever think that when we were kids playing Phantasmic that that would be you someday? And it, it was, it's, it's that, that has been one of the most impactful moments in my career thus far. I've been voicing Mickey for about nine and a half years, going on 10. Uh, which has flown by and is incredible to think about. Um, but in that moment, it was, it was really, uh, it was powerful to think. You know, I, the fact that I get to play even the smallest part in a legacy that is so huge and means so much to so many people. Um, yeah, it's just kind of, it's crazy. <laughs> it's very special. Yeah. Me? Okay. Um, I'm trying to put it in words without getting emotional, but you know, Disney is all about magic and making people happy and dreams. And then for all of you, um, you get to make people happy with what you do. What's it like knowing that what you do brings so much happiness and magic to people like everywhere? Hmm. Sorry, I know it's... Well, no, it's a great <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, as entertainers, that's what we love to do is make people happy. I did. Uh, five years as a stand-up comic before I came to Hollywood and got involved in voiceover. Um, we don't get that sense when I was performing in front of a live audience, I would get that, that sense, but uh, when you're in the booth, you don't get a sense of it. That was what, so for me, was uh, Prince and the Pauper, I think, was the first time I saw in a theater Goofy with a live audience and could hear them react. And that was just, it's, uh, I don't take it lightly at all because I know how magical these characters are and how dear they are to uh, the masses out there and how much they are loved. 
And it's really, it is heartwarming to see people's light up, uh, eyes light up when you do the voice and they just kind of, I recognize that voice. I grew up with that voice. It's really cool. That's awesome. <laughs> well, Gavin, you're going to need to see sort of firsthand people reacting to something you created in the last 10 days. Yeah, the exhibition in New York City really celebrates the iconography of this classic, um, beautiful creation that Walt brought to life in 1928. So to have the ability to curate an exhibition that pays homage to, you know, to Mickey's 90 years and create these contemporary moments with artists who are true originals in their own right, just seeing the magic between those, um, you know, those those great moments that we created in an exhibition has been really wonderful. So uh, I'm honored and also inspired by it, you know? Hey, so my question is for you, Darren. What was, I guess, a big challenge you faced when taking on this, you're essentially curating this like, iconic um, show that was going to be for Mickey's 90th birthday? Well, I've been a fan since I've been a little boy, and I actually did the 75th anniversary for Disney where we created um, a tribute to all the black and white cartoon strips. We did these graffiti murals in LA and New York on sides of walls in the city of these classic scenes. And then we did light projections of silent cartoons in areas of high foot traffic. So that was my early exposure to having a challenge of that kind. And it was really successful. So when they called me to do the 90th, we really challenged ourselves with something that would be over the top and something for classic Disney fans and this youth generation who's so interested in contemporary art. So for me, personally as a curator, I pulled from a lot of memories um, from my past and then having two little girls now, nine and six, to see Mickey and Mimi through their eyes. So I had a lot of great assets to work through. But um, I'm really proud of what we built. It's really, really special. I really recommend going to see it. And there's something for everybody in the exhibition. Sorry, Pat. <laughs> it seemed like when they asked an audience who could do Mickey's voice, a lot of hands went up, and Goofy, not too many, went up. Can you guys do each other's voices? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I don't know. <laughs> Gosh. I, can do it. I, I will never claim to do it. Well, no. Or really do no. it. No. Yeah. no. Uh, Wayne Allwine, who did the voice uh, Mickey for many years, always complained that he says, I, I voice a character that everyone can do. <laughs> you can get to the falsetto, it's a tone type of character. If you get into the falsetto, you're kind of in the ballpark. But what's lacking is the acting that Brett does. That's what really separates the, the people that can kind of do the voice and become the character. Mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, the acting is the, the, the part that's the hard part. Yeah, actually. yeah. The and maintaining it. Can you maintain yeah. the voice for like four hours mm -hmm. at a time? That's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah, but it is, it's fun to hear other people's impressions yeah. and how eager they are to share them. Oh, yes. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> yeah. everyone's just a fan, you know, we're all, we're Absolutely. two of the biggest fans, so, yeah. yeah. Craig, did you, you have one before? Did you yeah, start? Okay. Um, so for Bill, Brett has his great story about Fantasmic and hearing himself for the first time. Uh, is there any time you've been in a Disney park, heard your voice and had that kind of wow moment? Oh yeah, um, Mickey's Movie Barn at Toontown. Uh, Goofy and Donald are running the projector, some of Mickey's, you know, uh, movie clips and stuff. And uh, we got to ad lib a lot of that. For some reason, it just turned into one of those sessions where we were adding jokes on our own, and it wasn't scripted. And they used a lot of them in the event. It was so much fun to go in, oh, they used it. Oh, that was great. I wrote that. Not only voiced it, but I wrote that. That was, uh, that was and there, you know, anytime your voice pops up, you kind of, oh, OK, a talking toy or a mailbox that uh, talks or, you know, any, any kind of time that it, you aren't expecting the voice and it comes out of a speaker somewhere. It's always a little kind of unnerving. Oh, oh, okay, that's me. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's very you strange. Coffee with yourself in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> the TV and all of a sudden, it's like, what? My wife tells a story. We were on the Disney cruise ship and um, uh, the alarm rang in the morning and yeah, I got, uh, Jennifer got the phone. I said, who was that? She said, oh, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Just not a normal life. That's so cool. Hi. Um, so it's really rad. You guys all kind of come from different 
areas of the art world. Um, do you guys have a dream art project that you'd like to do with Disney? I would love to do a full-length A-list feature Mickey and the Gang movie. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to have that, and they're a little afraid to do it, I think. I don't yeah. know why, but just, uh, you know, just a big budget Mickey Mouse movie. Like the Muppets. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'd like to I see. I ditto that one. Maybe for the 100th. Yeah, there right. you go. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we've got 10 years to work on that. Right. <laughs> um, in a perfect world, the exhibition will travel and wind up at one of the parks as a ride. That would be oh, a dream. Wow. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, oh gosh, I mean, I, I will say announcing the ears today was, was a dream. It's something that I never, ever thought I would be doing. Um, and so to even say it, that was the first time I actually said it out loud, like, okay, I guess this is a real thing. <laughs> um, but I, I feel so, so blessed. I mean, Disney, between this past year, I got to write a book for Disney and, and design clothes for Disney and be the voice of Disney characters. And so I think um, just continuing to work for Disney, I mean, going back to the question, I think we all feel, you know, you were talking about yesterday on the panel is, you know, we all feel like we're continuing to carry the torch yeah. um, of, of, you know, just kind of Walt Disney's legacy and what he created. And um, I feel like I've won the lottery just yeah. getting to work for oh, this yeah. company. Absolutely. And it's not, I feel like anyone that works for Disney, we realize it's not about us. It's, right. it's not about like, oh, this is the role that I did. No, this is a privilege that we have mm -hmm. to work for this company. And I just am constantly waking up every day saying, how can I live up to this mm -hmm. opportunity that's been bestowed upon me? So I hope to just continue to maybe work with all facets of the company, but I will say to maybe get to do a voice of an animated character on like in a movie would be a dream come true. Um, this is for Ashley. Um, and like eight, about eight years ago, um, I met you and you said you were starting a company and, uh, and for Star Wars for Girls. What is it like now that you have start, not only started your company, but you're such an inspiration to so many, especially young girls, but not only young girls, and also with your book and... Thank you. Well, so yeah, so Denise and I go way back. Um, we actually ran into each other at the, the book stop, stop, the writer's mm -hmm. stop um, at Hollywood Studios during Star Wars weekends. And um, I was just there for a snack break, and I'd never heard of the carrot cake cookie. Have you guys had a no. carrot cake cookie? No. Okay, first of all, it, you have to. It's, okay. it's a religious experience. <laughs> uh, your life will never be the same after you have a carrot cake cookie. Um, so Denise introduced me to a carrot cake cookie, but we did. We had a chance to talk uh, about it there, and that was when her universe was just starting. I think I might have given you a sticker and mm -hmm. said, hey, go to heruniverse.com. We're going to make t-shirts for girls. And that was back when Star Wars was for boys. And mm -hmm. um, people literally told me that girls, women and girls would not buy Star Wars merchandise made for them. And this was even before Disney owned Star Wars. So mm -hmm. this was pre, you know, um, the acquisition. But I think... You know, the numbers, uh, female fans have always been there, and the numbers uh, stated otherwise. And, you know, 45% at the time of all sci-fi and fantasy fans were women and girls. And so I knew that um, if, if they just made us stuff, that we would buy it. But more importantly, at the time, women and girls were being bullied and being bullied terribly. And that was the reason I started Her Universe, because I, I wanted to build a community where women and girls would feel comfortable to step into the spotlight, just like Minnie stepped into the spotlight today and say, hi, I'm a girl and I like Star Wars. And because, you know, Star Wars, and, and we know this as fans, it's just like Disney, we're here celebrating it together. Star Wars is for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's To me, it's a story of hope. Mm -hmm. It's a story of good overcoming evil. You can't put a gender on that. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's for everyone. And so that was always my goal, is just to say, no, why, why are we even adding gender to this conversation. I hope we get to the day where we can say Star Wars is for everyone and Star right. Wars is for the whole family. Right. And um, I feel like, I mean, we're, we're, we're almost there today. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's amazing. And so I'm just grateful because I didn't do this alone. You know, I did this, you know, with you, Denise. You've been supporting me from the beginning. And, and I stepped, you know, out day one as, as the voice of Ahsoka. And the, and the reason I did it is going back to talking about carrying the torch. 
you know, now we live in a day with Ray and, and, and Jin and Sabine and Hera and all of these amazing, strong female Star Wars characters, but Ahsoka was the first female Jedi that was a lead in the Star Wars universe, and that was groundbreaking. And it was actually met with a lot of, uh, people didn't like her at first, and it was mm -hmm. met with a lot of kind of trepidation. But it, she put a lightsaber in a girl's hands for the first time. Mm. And so I so badly wanted to be a real life version of Ahsoka. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know what? When I saw a need for her universe, I thought, well, what would Ahsoka do? And Ahsoka would stand up for fangirls and Ahsoka would change the mentality. And so um, it's all because of Ahsoka. It's all because of Ahsoka, all because of Disney, and, and all because of the support. I said from day one, I said, united we stand, divided we fall. I can't do this alone. And so it's truly because of the fan base. We all did this together. Um, so thank you for helping spread the word. Thank you, and, and, um, and yeah, I think we're, we've made it a better place for little girls who like Star Wars and Marvel and all of these so-called boys' properties. And now they're for everyone. <laughs> Uh, Alan. Brett, you talked about coming to the voice work in a less than traditional means where your callback was your first time in a sound booth and, and yeah. Billy, you came from a, a stand-up background. Ashley, you do voice work. What, what advice would you give to people who want to look to do voice work and be the next one to carry the torch of the characters that you've, uh, you've portrayed? Oh, man. I think, and this goes for anything anyone asks advice for, when it's, if it's art or voiceover or whatever your interest may be, I think the key is practice, yeah. um, hard work, and just um, you know, a steadfast pursuit of your dream. If it's a passion of yours, yeah. then you, you, know, you make it a priority in your life and you pursue it. And so for me, it may have been my first time in the sound booth that day, first time being a voice actor, but I knew that I loved the character of Mickey and I loved the legacy and the story of Mickey. And that was what was my drive, you know? I wanted to represent that character. I wanted to play a part in preserving that character. Um, so I think my advice is, has always been, you know, pursue your creative passions. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, I, t I teach uh, voiceover via Skype and people, you know, hopeful kids that want to come out to Hollywood or get involved in some way. And I always tell them uh, the main things are uh, get rich parents <laughs> because it's very, very competitive and you, know, you take a lot of rejection. Uh, number two, and what I learned early from a mentor of mine, Dawes Butler, who was a great voice artist who did all the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, and about 40 others. He was the one that really said, you're not doing voices. It's not about the voice. It is about uh, acting. It's not voice acting, it's voice acting. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on the acting. So I tell, and get in front of an audience. Learn, uh, stand-up was the best training ground I ever had because you have to learn how to say a line. You see it on the paper, you've gotta make it jump off the paper and become alive. You have to give it life and in a way that entertains. And stand-up really taught me how to do that because in the booth you just get a script and you're not looking at anything, you just take the lines and make them real. So, and again, uh, what Brett said, you've got to do it because you're not fame and fortune and all of these other goals. You've got to do it because you love it. Passion. What they said. <laughs> <laughs> Brett, did you ever get a chance to meet Talking Mickey? Uh, I have had a chance to meet Talking Mickey on a few occasions, yes. And how was that? It was very meta. You did the voice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it was great. Uh, it was, I worked really closely with the team on that project for many years, uh, and I was really excited about it because of what it meant for the guest experience. Um, but it was weird. I didn't really go have my own interaction for a few years after it had even been released. Um, but I think two trips ago, when I was down here in Magic Kingdom, I paid a stop. Mickey's uh, magician, whatever it was called over there. Um, yeah, and it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool because um, even though I play a very special part in the character, you know, Mickey is still Mickey to me, and I will always be that little kid in my clubhouse playset, just being a, a fan. So it's it's it was great to talk to Mickey. It's pretty cool. Yeah, um, since we're here celebrating Mickey. For anyone who wants to answer, do you have a favorite Mickey cartoon that stands out above the others? Brave Little Taylor and the Pointer are my two. Uh, gosh, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> very, uh, 
Prince and the Popper was uh, That's great. Because there were two yeah. Mickeys. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> two Mickeys is always better than one. I mean, I've always loved seeing Runaway Brain. Yeah. That's it's just such an yeah. interesting one for me. I loved Mickey's Christmas Carol. I grew, yes. grew up watching that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question for you. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for, I mean, using chairs and for the, for that? Like, how did that all come about in Mickey coming out of a white wall? Like, what sort of inspired all of that for that at the exhibition? All right, well, I think it was a lot. Well, you know, we started the, the ideation with archives. Mm -hmm. So we really challenged ourselves to dig deep with Becky's help. And... Um, Specifically for Sorcerer's Way, I was fascinated with Walt's love behind Fantasound, that they would painstakingly set up these speakers in movie theaters to give the audience the same experience he wished for them to have. And through this artist, Oliver Clegg, who uses found objects and this assemblage practice with creating these canvases from different things that he thrifts or finds, the fact that he found old theater chairs was a nice hint via Fantasound in the, in the exhibition space. So that kind of came organically from the conversation with the artist. And then we reached out to Daniel Arsham and challenged him to create something iconic with one of his sculptures and through the wall, through the mirror. <laughs> through the wall, through the mirror, I always get it confused. Was the inspiration for that piece? And if you research it, he steps into the mirror and he you know, freezed one of those frames into the sculpture that you see. So it was a fluid conversation with all the artists, and um, like all of us, everybody was selected because of their love for Mickey and their love for Minnie and that passion. When you walk through the exhibition, specifically with those two moments, they feel so authentic, and that was the energy we looked to achieve in the exhibition. So I hope that answers your question. Um, for Brett, Bill, and, and Ashley in particular, um, you're very strongly identified with the characters that you've portrayed for so many years. Do you ever think about what you would have done if you weren't Goofy, if you weren't Mickey, if you weren't Ahsoka? <laughs> I'd be on the off-ramp of the forest. <laughs> <laughs> I think any actor would say, that's something you think about every day. Yes. <laughs> what I do if you weren't doing this. Wow, I don't, I don't know. Uh, my background was radio and stand-up. I don't know if I would have stayed in stand-up for very long. If I, it's, it's very tough. Um, gosh, that's a real good question, but I have no idea what I'd be doing. <laughs> well, I went to school for illustration, and I started my career as an artist and designer, and, I, mm -hmm. and I've maintained that throughout the years, maybe not as prevalent as before, but I think I would definitely do something in the arts, uh, still create, draw, paint, build. That's my other passion. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I touched on it a little bit. Uh, you know, being the voice of Ahsoka has changed my life in so many ways, and I'm so grateful, and I, I, I wouldn't change a minute of it. But I think, you know, it, it almost even took it in a different direction because I, I never would have started her universe if it wasn't for Ahsoka. So I certainly don't think I would be designing clothes or, uh, you know, I've had a business and, um, and you know, I, I moved out to LA just to be an on-camera actress. Actually, my dream was to um, just be on the Disney Channel. I didn't want to win an Oscar. I didn't want to win an Emmy. Nothing. I literally just wanted to be on the Disney Channel, and um, and uh, I had the chance to be on That So Raven on the Disney Channel, and it inspired me so much to children's programming. And I saw that you can directly make an impact and change a kid's life. Mm -hmm. Just like the Mickey Mouse Club changed my life, can change a kid's life through what you do. And you know, some actors don't want to be role models, but I really, I, I, I loved the challenge, and I, I, you know, took it on as as an extra part of the job. So, um, I just, I just wished that one day I'd get to play a role that made a difference mm. for kids. And Ahsoka, you know, I never saw it coming, and I'm just so grateful for it. Well, for the record, I'm glad that you each found your way to where you are. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Time for about two more. Matt. Before we go, can we hear Mickey and Goofy tell us to have a good day or something? Like <laughs> well, why not? We're so glad you're here. It's been wonderful hanging out with you, and we hope to see you real soon. Right, Goofy? Yeah, and have a great time while you're here. <laughs> so long. <laughs> so, well, now I feel like we have to end on that. <laughs> <laughs> One more. 
Otherwise, thank you guys so much for being here.